go. Over to you, Paul. Okay, cheers, Tom. Thanks. Thanks to Tom, of course, for uh, giving me the opportunity to have a chat with you uh, this year, um, which is which is fantastic. Um, I've been in this OSG for a few years now, the same as Tom and the same as a few of the others. And um, hopefully uh, you might find this interesting as long as I can get to work this. Okay, so what I'm going to discuss today is uh, open source, uh, updating an open source um, mobile working uh, practice because we already had open source within the authority and um, we go. Sorry, there's a little bit like that. Okay, sorry, yeah. So um, <clears throat> we already had it uh, set up, so we, we're just updating from, from where we were several years ago. Um, so I put a little um, caption on there. There's progress has little to do with speed, but much to do with direction. And that really sums us up, as you'll see as we go through, because we've, we're just basically a small organization. Uh, we've recently changed our the marketing uh, campaign, and you've, you've seen the banner, and Yoka logo, and everything else has happened over the last uh, few months. So um, effectively, we were left with, uh, we've, we've essentially got 130 people as uh, members of staff, and we've got uh, four people in IT. So there's myself doing GIS. We've got somebody doing security, somebody doing hardware. Uh, we've got a developer now, so things are looking much better. Um, a bit about me, I've jumped the gun a little bit. So I was a student um, of this college, actually, funny enough, when it was called West Glamorgan Institute of Higher Education back in 1982-84. And I did design here, graphic design. So I then became a charter designer before I stepped into local government. Um, I also became a circuit board inspector, planning technician, cartographer, etc. But the, the key thing about this slide is that I did a, had a design background coming into mapping. And that was a Quite a, quite a help because um, you you encounter things like layout and typography and color, and I think they're essential things when you go into mapping. And that's how I got into mapping many years ago um, because I was already a graphic designer. I could see maps were coming in, and I just decided to that that was the way to go for me. Um, <clears throat> so um, I've got a little blog as well with my own name. So I put a some stuff that I'm learning, uh, and I put it up on the blog at the same time. So if anybody else is in the same boat as me, then they can they can follow along and try and iron out some of the issues. So just a bit of a backstory here. I started, well, Fossil G, as we know, in the UK kind of started in 2013. In Wales, um, it started, uh, we had the first meeting in the Brecon Beacons National Park HQ back in 2013. And that was with uh, Kev and I think Sean and a few others who came to that meeting. And it was a result of the 2013 FOSS 4G um, event that was on that year. I think it was the first one in the UK, but I stand corrected if I'm wrong. So in 2016, then I joined BBMPA um, from Leith Patalbot and began to tweak the solutions that were already in place. And I was be uh, beginning to listen to users' requests. Uh, half were already few years. So there's... Um... Um, yep. There's a talk on at the moment, but a break. Uh... Sorry about that. So the other, so half of half of the people in um, in, in the, the park were already using QGIS. They were quite happy with it, and the other half uh, wanted us to move away from QGIS and use Google Earth. They wanted us to use KML and KMZ for basically everything. And why couldn't we have post just push everything into KML? Um, <clears throat> 2018 came along, um, we introduced ODK Collect. This was the first app that we pushed out to the park, and we decided that we would try it out in the volunteers. Um, so we did a project where we were looking at um, trying to find suitable walks, which were good for people with disabilities. Um, and we used this thing called ODK, which we recommended um, by Aberystwyth University. And they'd come across it as open source, and we thought we'd give it a try. <clears throat> And it went disastrous. Um, the, the reason for that is ODK, the way we set it up, was far too complex. We made a lot of assumptions that people would understand what GIS was. And it turns out it was a hard sell. Um, so the walks were never completed. Things moved on. People moved on. And it was generally felt that it was a bit too complex for the volunteers. So in 2020, um, pressure from uh, <laughs> ArcGIS Online came along. And I was sent um, a URL to, to set up my ArcGIS 
and I decided not to. I thought to myself, why? Yes, it's a free tool and it's an entry into the more complex and more expensive parts of the system. But I thought, well, I don't want it. And, and I was kind of making a decision for myself, not for the park. 2021, 22, uh, we, we had um, open source. We decided to have an open source first strategy. And basically, no one complained that they weren't using ArcGIS online. So I was quite happy about that. And we were lucky at the time because Data Map Wales was just being developed. And I knew I could rely on the Welsh government to, to back my decision if, if it came to it. <clears throat> so here we go. This was the ESRI screen they sent me. Further enhance your experience. And uh, they wanted us to comply with the partnership, of course, uh, and ask no questions and sign up. <clears throat> so I decided uh, I'm not going to further my experience. And the reason for that is I like failure, I like success, I like community, I like experimentation and problem solving, but above all, choice. And that's the key thing running through here. <clears throat> the choice to swap out components as technology advances or project support slows or may even be discontinued. That ability to be able to take out a component that's not working for you and substitute with something that you know perhaps will work through knowing from what your colleagues are doing, I think is invaluable. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so that's what we did. But the main thing that was coming from the management was that we, we, we needed to collect evidence uh, of global warming, global change, um, and we had to start using GIS uh, seriously. So the rationale was simple. Evidence must be collected transparently using open standards and open data wherever possible, and to make available for scrutiny in particular, reproducibility along with the algorithms used so that we can learn from the process and improve it in the future. And I think that's important because if we produce any uh, analysis, we should be able to simply be able to just get that out there and and be able to have it reproduced by someone if they need to. So of course, there are many GI systems out there and many cloud solutions that replicate algebra, remote sensing capabilities. So the problem wasn't a budget one, it was an attitude one. We've got plenty of capital budget, which we could have used to buy Esri software, but to me that, and that there was a lot of pressure at the time to go down the Esri route because everybody else, all the other big agencies were using it and why weren't we using it? Simple as that. <clears throat> So we decided, amongst the four of us, uh, to keep everything in-house. Um, difficult decision because we're a small group, but we found consultants were expensive, and the one we were using at the time was really expensive. They never revealed their methodology, never seem to be available when you have an urgent problem. Uh, if you want change, it's costly, and they're more interested in bigger contracts and bigger clients. So some ecologists were coming into us who were calling themselves consultants, but of course, they knew nothing about GIS. I found that a little bit strange as you're coming to work in a park. So I was constantly getting email from, from these consultants. Well, how do we do this? How do we use QGIS? What tool do I use to do this? And in the end, you, you kind of ended up doing the stuff for them. And I thought to myself, well, how stupid is that? Here I am doing, working for somebody else, doing the work for the consultants, and they take the credit for it. <clears throat> So let's rebuild our system, I thought. We've already got Postgres and we've got PostGIS in, in situation already. We've already got GeoServer and PG Admin. We've got all the tools that we really need in, in a sense. And we could have pushed everything out with just web services. But what we decided to do was take a slightly different route and mix and match in a way. So for example, uh, if you look at, the, if you look at uh, the first one down, we're still keeping QGIS. And I think it's important that we keep QGIS but we've added one thing that I think will augment what GeoServer is doing, and that is giving the QGIS projects a back end. So effectively, QGIS Server was, was the solution for that. It isn't as, in as much development um, at the moment because I think it slowed down a little bit, but I didn't want to put that in the way, if you like. Um, so that was the first thing, uh, component to put in, was keep QGIS as it was. People were using QGIS. There were some complex uh, systems and triggers in postures that we had to stick with because it would mean people effectively realigning their jobs to, 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 focus on, um, to focus on any changes. So for example, rights of way were very set in the way they worked and they wouldn't really take any changes. So we didn't want to alienate them too, too quickly. Um, <clears throat> 
So what we did was we, instead of using the old ODK um, software, we decided to change over to a similar model, which is called Kobo Collect. And as it happens, there's a little plugin for QGIS called QRealTime, which allows you to take your QGIS, uh, sorry, your PostGIS tables, push them up to Kobo um, Cloud, and then you can create a form from that, and then you can push the form out, and the data comes back from the, the hand, uh, your handheld device through the, the plugin back into QGIS. So we didn't realize that at the time, it was only when I found the Q real time plugin, I, I realized how we could fit it all together. So Cubo, uh, Cobo Toolbox is now in, in, the, in the process. Q real time taking stuff out to, to Cobo Server, collect stuff in the field. But this was only a solution in my mind that would work for the volunteers. We got volunteers, we got wardens, and we got staff. So we've got three kind of um, di different sections of people that we need to cater for. So the volunteers we knew we'd have a bit of a problem with because you can't assume they're GIS ready. We can't assume they've done a survey before, uh, but they've got lots of enthusiasm and they've got, um, they, they really want to learn as well. So <clears throat> we put Cobo Collect out for the volunteers. We created a very simple form. Uh, we had some work that needed to be done in the peatlands up on the, um, up on the mountain sides. And they were very keen to get going with it. So initially, we started with the ODK format, and we just put um, an Excel spreadsheet on Google, okay, just to get started, just to see if the whole thing would work. And <laughs> they went out in the field, they took all their data, they collected it all, and the following week, there was uproar. Um, it didn't work. That's, I, that's the only feedback I got. It just didn't work. I said, well, you know, give me a reason why it doesn't work. And they said, well, it's, it's too complicated. And they went into various reasons in this. And I suddenly thought, no, this isn't really a problem with the software. It's a problem with the, their understanding of what they're doing. And we added a little bit of training in, a little bit late, I must admit. But we did, we did add it in. And we found that uh, once they'd had the training, they went back out in the field and they found it great. The problem I got now is I can't get them onto Cobo Toolbox because they're so used to ODK. And they're happy with it. And it's still pointing on Google which shouldn't happen, but it was only meant to be a temporary method and it, it was gonna probably have a few tweaks to be made to it and then we, we'd follow it on. So uh, we've already had other uh, tools, if you look on the left hand side, this is reported. Um, this is the public rights of way reporting tool. This was already in place, but it is broken. Um, we had a developer recently to fix it for us. It's something I wasn't involved with. Um, it was too complicated for me to look at, to be honest, and um, I, I couldn't fix the problem. <clears throat> So in the meantime, we've, we've, we're happy with Kobo Toolbox and we want to get QField out as well because QField really is for the warden service, as you can see on the slide. We wanted them to be able to um, take their QGIS projects out in the field because the first thing they complained about is we don't have OS maps. They were paying for OS maps through the portal where you pay for six months, I think, and then you get full use of it. And we said, well, look, we've got a, we've got a, you know, an OS agreement with, uh, with the OS. So why don't we just prepackage the maps into geo package format, bring them on your phone? You have to. The only thing was they had to put a folder from their, uh, from, from that I was supplied them with onto their phones. And okay, they found that a bit difficult, but we got through the problem. Once they started using it for a few weeks, they were more than happy with it. They thought this is brilliant. My maps come up when there's no network. Isn't that brilliant? You know because we just pre-packed. It was just a simple solution. And then of course they wanted more layers added and we, we, uh, we started to have to pack the extra layers they required on, on the device rather than come, have them come through postages. But they're happy with it at the moment and we need to look at that in the future to make sure it uh, works a little bit better than that. Um, <clears throat> I think I've covered everything on there. Yeah. Oh, the other thing was of course, there was one element missing. We were playing around with our studio to try and get dashboards and uh, the analysis done in, in, a, in a nice interactive way. That came to a head because that, that was kind of halted for a little bit. And we looked at Looker Studio from Google, which provided me with a nice quick interface to quickly draw the data from the collection methods into a, an instant kind of uh, dashboard. <laughs> when you're given about a few hours notice, that's about the only choice you've got really, because we didn't have anything else in place. So let's have a look at um, a solution that I'm going to take forward. Um, 
it was a hard decision because I knew Welsh Government were working on data map Wales, and I knew that was, um, I think it's Mapstone and Geonode. Am I right, Kev? Yeah. yeah. So we, I think I was looking at it roughly at the same time as these guys were. But once I realized Welsh Government were working on it, I backed off because it's going to be in place, it's going to be used, and I can push people towards data map Wales to, uh, to get the data they want if, if it's not available through our uh, post uh, store. Um, so we looked at QGIS Web Client, and for me, and this is just a personal thing, but I, taking into account people's abilities in GIS, I thought we need something fairly simple so they could print off OS maps if they needed to, do a few little bits of uh, small analysis, and take away, strip away as much of it as I could, and just have web services in there. Um, so that hasn't been thrown out yet. It is in production. It is ready to go. But we have one, one or two little slight issues with it. Um, so this slide is just to show you how accurate and how easily you, you, you know, and how well it performs in terms of making the data look the same in both platforms. Which I think is important if you're into cartography and you want symbology and you want text and you want everything you set up in QGIS to look the same when you put it out. Again, you can do a lot of this with SLD and various other things, but um, we decided on this route. Here's a closer look at it. You've got a nice, nice little sliding door effect there where you can look at two layers. Um, the, uh, one of the things I wanted was a good uh, legend view, which, which is, is so important because when you're trying to explain something to somebody, you, if you just show them the you know, results of uh, supervised classification or something similar, they won't know what the hell you're talking about. So um, that's just a close up there of. Um, of how that looks. It's just got a simple search field in it, a couple of simple tools, but everything is mainly on the top right hand side in the little burger menu, and you've got a couple of tools on the bottom as well. So you can also put a QGIS server front end on your, on your web service, uh, which just basically looks at the QGIS projects that you've already set up in QGIS server, and you've got all the little metadata links on the browse links and so on. That's already made up. That is somebody else's version of it because I haven't got to this stage yet. But that's what it would look like. It's very easy to, to, to scroll through the data and you can see it visually as well. So I think that makes a lot of sense to people then. <clears throat> Another thing we looked at was QGIS Web, uh, sorry, Q, uh, Just Quick. Just Quick was um, a project that has been around for a few years. But it's kind of dwindled a little bit in terms of development. So I thought, I've only got QGIS to web plugin with QGIS to work with. So what else is out there? So I found just quick. So I signed up, and um, I think I put a couple of things up on GitHub to, to get out and try and understand how it worked. And I found it the most um, easy to use interface because you send your project from the from your QGIS project through the plugin up onto their server, but it was so natural and easy to understand that I thought, right, I'll put a couple more projects up on there just to see what people, how people react. And in general, the reaction to just quick has been pretty good. Not the one I'm probably going to end up going with, um, but nevertheless, a viable option for us in the future, potentially. Um, this one is another temporary one, putting up uh, a grid of 100 meter blocks for the peatland volunteers to go out and, um, and, and use uh, the, the grid itself to try and align as best they can with their GPS receivers and their survey points. So one of the uses of QGIS to web, I like it. I think it's, uh, again, development has slowed down on that, uh, as far as I understand. But it still works, and uh, with, with 322. Um, another thing we tried, uh, we've, we've established, is a, a little program called WebODM, which is Open Drone Map. I don't know if anybody's come across this, but it's a great little tool. It stitches all your images together from, um, from, your, um, from your drone. We bought about a handful of, I think we bought about four uh, Phantom 4s, which we did a bit of training on, and then we, we pushed them out to the volunteers to take out on site on our own land and uh, see how they got on. In fact, they loved it. They did the qualifications with uh, with the organization that, uh, I, don't, I can't think where they're going now. Um, so they did their qualifications through that and um, 
we were away. Um, so again, it's a, it's something I found that I, again we didn't want to pay for it. So um, it's twofold. It's such as images, you know, resulting as a three D lidar data uh, measurement tool. You can archive as well with it, which was one of the reasons why we wanted it. Um, <clears throat> and you could download everything as uh, in, in a single package, which you could then open in, Q, in Q, QGIS. So that was great. And this is a little uh, screenshot of what it looks like. It's a ready-made tool, as I said. It's very simple to use. Um, it's, a, it's a nice little easy dashboard on there. The tools are very simple. And this one just shows one of the stones that were manifested in, 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 in Brecht Meekins. And the, the idea with this was that we could use it as an archive of some sort so we could see the condition of the stone, whether it was getting damaged through the years or whether it was sinking in its foundations um, and, and so on. So that gives us a nice little tool there for, and this is open for the volunteers to go in and use and, uh, and, and uh, play around with. Again, you can see on the top of this slide, there's a chip in the stone, uh, which is one of the one of the prompters for us to, to use a tool that we can say, well, look, if we get a nice close up of the a nice 3D image of the condition of the stone, we can go back to it in a year or two, and then we can see if there's any change, <clears throat> and then maybe do another flight. So again, I'm old fashioned. I still like grass. I love grass. I think it's probably the best. If I had one GIS only, uh, it would be grass because it's got all the tools you need. It works well with Postgres and PostGIS, um, and it does some fantastic uh, visualizations, in particular water runoffs and uh, watersheds and so on. So if you do get a chance to use it, it seems very complicated to get into. But once you get into it, it, you can use it through the command line. You can use it through uh, uh, GUI. You can use it. Through Jupyter Notebooks, you can use it in all kinds of ways because it's the modules themselves that are the important thing. And this is a <clears throat> this is a module called our watershed, and it reveals how water flows down the mountains, obviously, and where our watersheds are. Um, this wasn't done in QGIS; it's just purely done in Grass. But of course, you can put it into QGIS with the plugin. <clears throat> We've been doing um, a bit of interaction with uh, Richard Lucas from Aberystwyth University, and with, with the uh, I think it's called Welsh Data Cube, and <clears throat> we've been doing some tutorials with Aberystwyth to try and see how we can use um, the data that they're, they're producing for us in web map format, web map service format. So I just quickly, uh, and people didn't realize there was a 3D element to QGIS, so this kind of introduces them to the, the 3JS uh, plugin and the 3D view, just to show them what it can do. And they were quite gasped because they thought, well, oh, QGIS, I thought you could only edit parts in it, or, you know, they don't realize how much power is in it. <clears throat> And we can introduce that power as time goes on, as they get more confident. So we went into a serious uh, thing about where we get where we get to with with the mobile working with the mobile tools. I think I've jumped the gun on this. Actually, uh, the big problem was, of course, we didn't have network connectivity, and there were concerns about warden safety. Uh, they needed to see boundaries. They needed to up update their conditions in the field, and so on. Uh, Qfield, as I said earlier, was the solution. Uh, the Geo package um, was was the first step on that. We did look at QGIS Cloud as well. Now, QGIS Cloud is kind of an extension of Qfield, but it's a paid ver um, cloud version. Um, if you go for the free version, I think you have to um, allow your data to be open to the world, basically. So <laughs> there was a bit of pushback with that because we didn't want to put the data out to the world and they didn't want to pay anyway. So. It was back to QField again on its own. But we did, of course, use the sync plugin for QGIS, um, which allows you to sync the projects when they come back in. <clears throat> so another tool we did was the, uh, the Kriganos ground management tool. And this is a simple way. They wanted a way to be able to, when they're working on the paths and when they're putting concrete down, uh, uh, or when they're mending the paths and, and doing various things, they're putting uh, finger posts in or whatever, they needed a tool to be able to monitor and see how that was going on. So we just basically did a uh, run around with a GPS on the paths, broke them up into five meter sections, and then we just allowed them to just pick a five meter section or two or three five meter sections, and then just say, okay, these are the three meter sections that we're going to tarmac over, or we're going to put uh, gravel down or whatever it was. <clears throat> and again, we're just running a, a web feature service through that. 
and uh, it, it, we're lucky within Craigenhalls Park because it's got a fairly good um, network anyway. But of course, if you go outside the park, it gets a bit less less good. <clears throat> so just two little screenshots. Another thing we did in the, in the park is uh, we broke the whole park up into hexagonal polygons so that they could, without defining a polygon itself, they could pick areas they wanted to work on and give them a status. So they could look at this grid in its total uh, area at any point and see where the work is going on and what status it's at. Uh, nice, nice little uh, project. Um, but again, it's, it's waiting for that point where I can get in to see the manager and, 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 and get it out. Uh, on the right hand side, you've got Kobo. Uh, this is how easy it looks. It's, it just fill in a blank form. Uh, when you finish answering the questions on the form, you send the form back straight to the server. Um, I think I've got a few pictures further on it, how it looks if you've never come across it. Here we are. This is the kind of thing you can do with it. You can do a lot of mathematical, uh, you know, sort of background uh, scripts and so on. You can, you can add, it's just Excel. If you're any good at Excel, you can probably understand what's going on there. But um, yeah, you just put into a cell the, the formula that you need to give you the results and it does the job. <clears throat> the people and volunteers are using it, they love it, and uh, they don't want to part with it. Another project, uh, again, I don't know what I'm doing for time, um, is, the, um, is working with the Brecon Beacons Park Society. And we've got an old guy there, he's 75 years old, and he still uses QGIS. He's been using it for several years. And I think, well, what a, what a testament to, to QGIS um, and, and the way it's going forward. So this was just to show how we, uh, they wanted to monitor tramways, tram roads through the park. And they wanted their own customized symbology. They wanted everything, every point numbered. <clears throat> On the right side, you can see there how we packed, pre-packed the, uh, the OS maps so they can go out and site with them just in a single geo package. And again, you can put links for documents and so on. This is a straight document to a Word, uh, a link to a Word document with uh, some of the database information in it. So when they're out on site, you can quickly flick from one to the other to see and refer to previous, um, refer to the documentation on that uh, site or point. So we, we, we have had some drawbacks. Um, workflow integration isn't what I wanted to be um, in the sense that, yes, we've got all of these things working. We've got some parts of it working, but the whole workflow needs to be re-looked at, in my opinion. We need to automate a lot of stuff with FME. <clears throat> I've been putting that off for a long time. Um, and of course, some of the managers are already looking at, well, we want to model some of the things that we're doing and, and try and get some sense out of them and so on. And of course, metadata and data on data map whales has got to be in that mix as well. So a couple of future disruptors, which we are looking at, keep an eye on, uh, OpenAI, Google, CCM. CCM is of, of interest to me because we are working in, a, in a, such an interesting park and with, with so much great uh, you know, uh, topology and so on. Uh, AVR, <coughs> VR advances, drone robotics, we keep an eye on that as well. <clears throat> so again, I'm, we are being pushed towards Jupyter Notebooks through Avarice with because uh, it's, it's an easy way of getting, a, is it, I don't know if you're familiar with Jupyter Notebooks, but essentially they're just Python. And they allow you to uh, put, basically make reports, put your text in there, it's marked down. And you can put, you can just do your live coding inside uh, inside cells. Uh, great idea. Pushing that onto staff is going to be a hard sell because it is very much hit or miss. I think the the kernels and, and the various things that work within. I'm trying to think, maybe the way they've got it set up, I'm not sure what happens with, but it does fail quite a bit uh, when you're trying to do something. So I think that failure might translate into. Oh, it's too difficult to use, and uh, we, we don't want this. But we're going to try it anyway. We're going to see how far we can go with it and, and see, see, see what we do, see how we get. Again, I'm looking at Cesium, as I said. And R, I've been playing around with. I like R. I find, to be honest, I didn't learn uh, Python at the start. I did go straight into R, and I quite liked it because it seemed to me to be quite si simple to do with the basic things like connect to post just and so on. So, and, and, of course, you've got all the... QGIS algorithms and GRASS algorithms, which you can pull into R. So again, I'd like to do more work on that, but um, time is, is just impossible with just, just me doing it. 
So in summary, of course, I'm still learning after 30 years. This not a, this, there isn't a perfect solution for everything we do. Not everyone shares my enthusiasm. Skill sets for geospatial are dwindling. People are less interested in knowing the likes of QGIS. They want something that's just push a button once on my iPhone. I don't care what it does in the background, just as long as I get a result. Nobody really wants to understand uh, the, the algorithms and the, and the various things going on in the background. And I noticed that in the last three years, really. <clears throat> So just to remind everybody again, I like failure, success, community experimentation, problem solving, above all choice. Maybe it's a little bit personal and a little bit biased there, but uh, for me, it's why I'm still working. I think that's the last slide. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> it's a lot there. <laughs> Yes, same. Well, same thing. I call it the same thing. It isn't the same thing, or is it? I don't know. <laughs> Merging was an option. Yeah. Merging, and I think they do a three, a free starter, don't they? Yeah, they do. yeah, yeah. They do. Who knows? But they're happy with QFIELD at the moment. So again, who knows? That may change in a year's time. We may be forced down the Esri route in a year's time. Who knows? I hope not. In fact, that can be a measure for you because if I come here next year, you know we're still on open source. <laughs> if I'm not here, you know why. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Paul. That was uh, that was brilliant. Um, really interesting. I left Neath Portal about five years ago and I've still got a rights way officer emailing me asking when Welsh Government are going to sort out their survey, mobile survey and tool so that you can get off uh, uh, their unnamed supplier. So I'm just going to point him to you now. You know who he is anyway. I'm just going to tell him to email you for everything he needs from now on. Brilliant. Um, 